எல்லோருக்கும் வணக்கம் மதுரை வீரன் இஸ் ஹியர் இஸ் த மோஸ்ட் காம்பேட்டிவ் பொலிட்டிஷியன் ஃப்ரம் தமிழ்நாடு விசிபிள் ஆன் டெலிவிஷன் ஸ்கிரீன்ஸ் ஸோ இன் சம் வேஸ் உமார் he symbolizes the idea of dissent in the economic and financial world he has been speaking an outspoken uh, critic of the government on fiscal federalism and the methods that they've been adopted and has espoused the cause of his fiscal uh, federalism i think most uh, passionately and art- in great lucidity and articulation so uh, that was really nice to see and i think students of finance and economics sitting behind should know a little more about you but today we are discussing the tamil nadu model and uh, i am an old fan of this model so we are in some ways uh, in a similar so in in pre independence era i don't know how many students you know madras municipality used to give free food to school students uh, i think it was the swatantra party and uh, raja ji who used to do it and then kal uh, k kamraj as the chief minister expanded it and thereafter in 1983 under mgr it was universalized in tamil nadu now not many people know that two of the largest funded programs in india originated from an idea in tamil nadu and which one of them is the midday meal schemes which has propelled india's literacy india's enrollment numbers and the the way the government at the center looks at welfare of students it has brought up and there are several studies if students are interested you should look up world bank studies on uh, malnutrition on better education on enrollment and others but this midday meal scheme actually created the room for another idea mr nt ramarao in the neighboring state of andhra pradesh introduced the 2 rupees per kilo rice idea which today is the national food security act which was passed in 2013 till recently people had to pay for the ration and now they getting it free 800 million people in india get free ration and that's the second one i'm sure there are other ones i recall uh, the more interesting ones as the ones that were done for maternal mortality maternal health which is again a world bank recognized program uh, but for the youngsters if chennai and the area around chennai is called the detroit of the south or detroit of india it is because tamil nadu created the model for the ecosystem of automobiles and automobile giants almost 50 to 100 fortune 500 companies are here so there is a tamil nadu model at play and we recognize that i will ask you to speak about the tamil nadu model and maybe we will have some questions and some questions from the audience but the one striking thing that i that uh, you must explain is how does tamil nadu fund all this first thank you for inviting me second let me just correct a factual error the free food in madurai you know, in chennai what was then madras corporation was started by the justice party, justice party in yeah. 1921 uh one last caveat i am the establishment i am a finance minister in a large industrial state one of the biggest economies in the country if i am seen as a voice of dissent something is structurally but, wrong but you are right? but you are <laughs> so, seen as the voice oh, of so, dissent in the gst sense. council you <laughs> know i agree i agree that means something is structurally wrong because a man who should be riding the establishment train if i am the one having to point out a lot of things something must be structurally wrong so let's leave that for a second i think the core difference of the tamil nadu model what we call the dravidian model or what one would have called the justice party model going back to the 20s is a focus on human development in the sense that if you have a stratified society where opportunities for education are restricted to some 
where opportunities for employment are restricted to some. By definition, you cannot have a weighted average productive kind of workforce, right? You're, you're keeping people suppressed. Now, we could not have envisioned that 100 years from the first Justice Party government, we would have a global economy and therefore weighted average productivity would be the single best predictor of your competitiveness uh, because you're no longer competing just state to state. Like our greatest competition is Vietnam for the ex-China trade, right? So, Maybe you should explain that in one line. Yeah. No, I'm saying as people are de-risking China and as they're moving their supply chains and uh, their operations out of China and the financial services companies are moving it out of Hong Kong, then the natural kind of destinations are India at a country level, but within India, Tamil Nadu for various reasons, for the workforce, for the... Uh, mass of existing companies that already do that for the connectivity of the of the internet wires for various reasons uh, mostly the workforce availability Tamil Nadu is a natural destination within India but when we compete of course some of them also come to Kerala I mean to uh, Telangana or Gujarat or other places but by far our greatest competition especially in the manufacturing space especially in high-end services is Vietnam and that's just the way the, you know, the economic model works out. We are at that, we are like a middle income country, we're about 4,000 US dollars per capita income. We have a very high uh, tertiary education ratio, about 52% of our young children of college going age enroll in a college. Almost all of them speak English. Therefore, we have a globally competitive workforce with relatively high skill and relatively low labor costs compared to most kind of advanced destinations. But if I go back to my original point, the point was that we wanted opportunity for all, education for all. The, the original legislation for compulsory elementary education passed in 1921 under Diaki said boys and girls in 1921. Equal education for boys and girls in 1921. So in various ways, um, we did social justice as the core of everything. And in some sense, that's very similar to Singapore. If you've heard uh, Senior Minister Tharman uh, Shanmugaratnam talk about the Singaporean model and how they went from 400 or $450 per capita to $45,000 per capita income in less than 50 years or so, the model of the late Lee Kuan Yew was to engineer the society and the economy would progress. Make sure that everybody's educated, everybody's got nutrition, you have communal harmony, you design the housing estates and the primary schools in such a way that the ethnic Malays and the ethnic Chinese and the ethnic Indians, many of them Tamils, have to get along. And you build this harmonious society, you give quotas, only so many people can congregate in one place, you know, you can't have a building block that's 80% Chinese. And you engineer the society in such a way that the productivity, the opportunity, the investment comes. Now, Singapore had some other advantages geographically, just like Tamil Nadu has some other advantages. But the building block is human capital and a harmonious society. And I think that's the hallmark of the Tamil Nadu model. That's the rationale and that uh, it has been recognized also in terms of the uh, human development indicators and other uh, aspects. But there is also this question that comes up now and I don't know uh, whether the word is popular here or heard before. Uh, some of what is being done by in Tamil Nadu or by regional parties has a nomenclature now in Delhi. Uh, some years back I had done some study about manifestos and I found that Tamil Nadu even gave goats uh, promised goats and gave goats to uh, people and it led me to sort of examine whether there was any change and the subsequent animal census showed that the goat population had gone up. Now that might be a correlation or there might be a coincidence but I don't know whether there was a causation. But coming to the things that I mean the perception is that much of what is done by parties in Tamil Nadu is to buy votes and that's how welfare is born and the phrase that is used frequently in Delhi is the Ravidi culture or the freebie culture. 
do you think the uh, tamil nadu welfare model rests on freebie culture or how would you like to sort of contest that view as with everything i'll answer this in about six different layers of depth so let's start with the first one the word waved in all is yesterday's word right it was spoken by somebody at some rally and it caught on otherwise i didn't know that i hadn't heard the word waved like one year back so waved is not the freebie culture i had heard 100 times before so let's look at it as that uh, perspective i think back in 2018 or something i had given a long exposition i said you know every government everywhere in the world provides something for free to its citizens maybe it's free road transport without charging tolls maybe it's free education at government schools maybe it's free healthcare at government hospitals so saying freebie culture again is kind of a you know low level like you thing it's not it's not sophisticated people shouldn't engage in this then you go to the definition which the 15th finance commission used where all the terms which then you know then as a populist measures uh, which the then finance minister through arun jetli put in and i argued in front of the 15th finance commission and now my my now friend through nk singh who is the chairman of the finance commission would agree i said who gets to define what is populist do you as a finance commission get to decide do the people get to decide is there a economic textbook definition of whether i give 5 kilos of rice it's essential food and i give 8 it's populist you know these are all nefarious concepts populist is easy to say the word but how will you categorize a measure as populist or not populist then you see political hypocrisy that has no you know limits the same people who are telling us about rave and all in the himachal pradesh election my counterpart and good friend the union finance minister published a statement showing the 50 things they promised for free were they to get elected in himachal pradesh they didn't that's a different story so is it that when they promise it it's considered development measures and if we give it it's considered free i mean these are all meaningless you know this is just political posture sure, it, let's go down to the real issue the real issue is if we provide things for free some of them will be accretive they will add more value to society than me spending that money any other way some of them will be mixed they will add some value but also create inflation and create other problems if you want i'm happy to give you examples and some of them will be downright bad for example since i have no political angle here i'll take the cow and goat scheme both of them were introduced by our predecessor late chief minister ms jalta it turned out the goat scheme was quite successful as you say because sourcing goats was not that hard there was already enough hybrid genetic kind of composition in the goat population and it was much easier to breed goats and they were productive in multiple ways from milk to mutton to everything else and they were relatively easy to feed so the goat scheme actually was quite successful i mean that it reached some limits but that's a different story it allowed women to make a decent yeah. living and a gift the cow scheme turned out to be almost impossible to implement and i say this because i was a member of the public accounts committee and saw a whole bunch of um, ag reports audit reports because the way they designed the scheme just think about the complexity now if i have to give somebody a free cow the question is where do i source the cow from if i source the cow from within the state i got two problems one the total population of cows doesn't increase that means i'm just circulating the cows between some buyers and other buyers and the market's intervening into an efficient come I mean, the government is intervening into an efficient market and will distort it and i'm going to have genetic inbreeding so then the logic was that you go and get the cow from outside the question is who will buy the cow and who will accept the cow as a donation from the government or a benefit from the government so then they came up with a smart idea no no you should take the beneficiary with you on the trip to andhra pradesh or karnataka or some place to the mandi to the cow uh, exchange you know the market and then you should jointly select the cow then the local farmer says by looking at a cow i can't tell whether it's a good cow or not i need to know whether it milks properly or not I said okay no problem 3 days average milking and then you'll decide whether it's a good cow and then that can be bought and brought back how many cattle markets do you know where they let you check out a cow for 3 full days none 
So effectively, the scheme became unimplementable. They just either the beneficiary wouldn't go, or they'd bring some cow back and say, "No, no, but now the cow doesn't produce milk," and it became unimplementable, and we stopped doing it. So having an idea is one thing; executing it is something else different. Take the MNREGA. Right? Take the MNREGA, excluding when you have a pandemic and there's no work and nobody has any income. Under normal circumstances, if we pay people, let's say, 200 rupees a day for X number of days a year, and they do some real work, then we are getting a win-win-win. Those people get a subsistence income. The state gets some work done and probably cheaper than giving it to a big contractor and allowing corruption and stuff like that. And the society gets the benefit of the newly built Anganwadi or the the dike in the river or the you know cleaning of the temple tank or whatever it is. But if you pay people to do nothing, now what you're doing is you are actively creating inflation because what you're doing is in the rural areas you're paying people 200 rupees a day to do nothing. If they do nothing, then the people who do something will ask now for daily wages of four or five hundred rupees, so that they are compensated fairly. Those are the people working on agricultural output. That means the input cost of the rice or the uh, you know whatever pro crop goes up. That means the output crop price goes up. So now what you have effectively done is you have injected money for zero extra productivity. And you've increased the liquidity and kept the input cost high and kept the output the same. That is the definition of inflation. You have just created inflation. So these schemes need to be thought of very, very carefully, thoughtfully. Sometimes it's in money. Sometimes it's in insurance value. Like if we used to give gold for, even though we didn't start it, I was okay with it because it prevented somebody from having to go and take a loan. And you know, there's no like uh, an unsecured credit in the bank, right? If they take a loan, they're taking it on the street. At usurious rates of interest, but the problem was that the previous government they fell behind by four years. So if the wedding happened today, you'd get your gold four years from now. How is that going to prevent you from taking a loan today? So it became infructuous. It became useless four years from now. We don't even know if they're still married. When Many you place don't. the TV, mobile phone, uh, yeah, I don't think anybody gave mobile PCs. phone. Mobile phone we give only to disabled people who need special communication. Right now, the government of Tamil Nadu gives mobiles only to people with disabilities. But the TV we gave at that time, we gave the TV as a principle of social justice. We didn't realize the benefits we were going to get from it. We gave it as a principle of social justice because we went from having one Doordarshan kind of uh, channel to an explosion of cable and uh, few OTTs like we have. But now there's many more. And what would happen in villages is that the poor people would go and stand outside the rich people's windows to watch the TV through the window because they couldn't afford their own TV. So our chief minister, our late leader and late chief minister, Thir Kalangya, he wanted to make sure that nobody had to go and stand outside somebody's house for two hours, three hours watching TV through the window. And so he said, "Well, you know, they were cheap. They were like two thousand rupees. They were like a, a small CRT screen." But now you see all the studies, and it turns out that giving village people the awareness of what the rest of the world was like actually reduced domestic violence. It increased kind of other participation of women in the workforce. Stuff like these are all like Oxford University studies. These are not Tamil Nadu studies, and I can send you the references. But I don't think we envisioned all those secondary benefits. When we gave it, we gave it as, and it was like you know, it was a few hundred crores, right? Two thousand rupees a family for a few families. It was a relative to the budget. It was an irrelevant amount of money, but it was a social justice thing, and it got ancillary benefits we didn't expect. So, to come back to the somebody is paying for this, yeah. And while the growth is there, this is a good idea. It works. Uh, I don't know how accurate. This is because when I first saw this number, I was a little taken aback. The Reserve Bank of India's recent state of state finances report says that all the states put together in India uh, offer subsidies of three lakh crore something, and Tamil Nadu tops it with one lakh crore or something. So I'm a little struck by that number. But is Tamil Nadu the highest in subsidies? Uh, in terms of in in the non-development expenditure scheme, Tamil Nadu is behind Uttar Pradesh and two other states. But how do you uh, sort of 
And the, the more important question is, how do you fund this? Yeah, so I, you know, either you are implying a point in time issue or you're implying a historic issue. So let me just address the historic issue first because I think that's more meaningful. When no, no, of course historical because yes. this is a trend in Tamil Nadu. Yeah, yeah, so, that, so that's what I'm saying. So yeah. then, let me put it differently. Yeah. When the FRBM Act was introduced in the parliament and passed under the late Prime Minister Thiru Vajpayee, uh, and equivalent acts were passed in all the states, at that time Tamil Nadu's debt to GDP ratio was about 28%, and its interest to revenues ratio was about 21%. Mm -hmm. In 11 years after that, first ADMK government from 3 to 6, then DMK government 6 to 11, then ADMK government 11 to 14, before Ms. Jailalta's incarceration in Bangalore. In 11 years, Tamil Nadu's finances improved dramatically. We went from 28% debt to GDP down to 16. We went from 20, 21% interest revenue down to 11. We were the model state. We had fantastic outcomes. No other state improved that much. And all while we were doing what you would consider to be freebies or subsidies or transfers or something. I'm saying basically you have to decide which way your model works. Now I'm saying that we had six or seven years of really bad economic management. I don't say that politically. I was saying it outside. The statistics show that we went back from 16-17% debt to GDP to 26-27 before the pandemic. And then we went back to a really bad uh, interest ratio. And then last year we showed a huge improvement. This show will, will, uh, year will show another huge improvement. And we will show such remarkable progress that in two years we would have wiped out probably 90% of the slide of seven years. That's amazing outcome. We have not in any way changed our philosophy that human development should be at the core of it. For example, my chief minister has announced a program which we funded as a pilot program last year, which we're taking up in greater scope this year, which is a free breakfast program. Now, is that a freebie? Is that ravedy? Is that development? In my mind, I couldn't have come up with a single better way to spend those few hundred crores. Because what it does, it makes sure that the kids who go, and this is first starting at elementary school, it makes sure that the kids who go to school go with the right level of nutrition or arrive with the right level of nutrition greatly increases the likelihood of learning properly through the course of the day. We are doing it for the corporation school or government school children who are the poorest of the poor. The great feedback we've had is why are you not doing that for the rest of the schools because middle class parents, many of them are now two working family parents and they're saying I find it hard to feed my children cooked food before they go to school at 7 or 7.30 or 7.45 very early in the morning, right? Now, here's the difference though. When we do the free lunch program, we do it through the traditional way. I don't want to get into it, but I'll just say that more than 50%, in fact, more than 60% of the total cost is labor. And, you know, that, that's not an efficient way of doing it. But in the breakfast program, what we have done, in the rural areas, we have created self-help groups of the mothers of the children who are the beneficiaries. We give a block grant to the local body. They give the money to the self-help group. Those people procure the items, prepare the food and deliver it to their own children on the premises of the school. Do you think that's going to be high quality or not? Of course it is. I'm feeding my own child. In the urban areas, we use the latest technology, Internet of Things, as much automated as possible. And we maintain the quality and the hygiene at central kitchens for every block. And then we send the food to the uh, actual schools. So here our labor costs are a small fraction of the total. And therefore the program is much more efficient and much more consistent quality with much less leakage and other problems. And we're not looking at, you know, 2,000 crore statewide tenders and all where there's a risk of other problems. Right? I, I so we have greatly improved the delivery model, but the principle remains the same. We want to feed the children because that is the greatest investment we can make in our future. So our model of success starts with let us get really well fed, well educated, healthy human beings, the rest of it will fall in place. Another model will say let me build roads, let me build ports and then they will come. Right? That's what the union government model is basically. About 5% of the budget has shifted from social spending to infrastructure. It's another matter that 60% of the projects are behind time and maybe the you know 
Agra Kanpur highway is like 12 lane and only like 20 years from now it will be fully utilized. That's a different matter. But they have a different model of development. We have a different model of development. Ours is producing results. Why does somebody think they can tell me what I should do differently? In every measure, in every statistic, Tamil Nadu is double or better than the Indian average. And of the states where you say they are focusing a lot on infrastructure. Let them catch up to us, then we'll see. So hold the thought one minute. I want to just sort of give a background note. Almost every centrally sponsored scheme in India came out of some state. Narega is actually born as the employment guarantee scheme in Sangli. Midday meal scheme born in Tamil Nadu. Uh, you see the later versions of the PM Kisan Yojana. They were born in Telangana and in Odisha. Uh, the Jan Aushadi schemes, the free uh, medical scheme was born in Tamil Nadu and in Andhra. There were several schemes, with the, all of these were called freebies or AVDs or whatever at some point of time and all of them have been assimilated into the uh, national uh, development programs. Currently the government gives uh, money to farmers to overcome a certain deficit. Now all of these you can call them flyover economics, you can call them Robin Hood economics, you can call them whatever. But the fact is that there is a general consensus that all of this has been assimilated into the uh, program. Now the worry at the center is that the government of India is do doing X amount of welfare, its deficit level is whatever, whatever it is and whether this is a good idea or a bad idea. I mean, I don't know how many people know that just on direct benefit schemes, the National Payment Corporation of India, which is where the money goes from the government to the individual, uh, which you receive the OTP and the SMS saying that your money has come, NPCA has listed 8,000 plus user codes for welfare schemes, out of which maybe half are not functioning. Government of India runs something like 310 day, uh, direct benefit uh, transfer schemes. I don't know uh, how much. But the central question to this, is, min Mr. Minister, is that yesterday I was reading a report put out by Dr. C. Rangarajan and uh, in Shanmugam about Tamil Nadu being a one trillion dollar economy and they examined whether this could happen in 2030 and they have come to the conclusion that it could probably happen in 2034 or that it might it will require a nine percent consistent growth. Now we also know that Tamil Nadu is on the wrong side of the demographic story in, in the terms of your uh, replacement rate. I mean, you know, I don't know how many people here, youngsters, you know, there are not too many people following you because the replacement rate in Tamil Nadu is 1.4, which is the lowest in India. It, it, it's the outcome of development, it's an outcome of education, and it's also an outcome of women's empowerment. Uh, Tamil Nadu has the highest number of women working in manufacturing, and that says something, uh, I think, uh, about uh, the social culture of the state. But if you have to grow at 9% and if you have a high sustained expenditure which is classified in whatever way as non-development, what are the steps that you would like to take? One of the criticisms that is or one of the points that Dr. Angarajan's report says is the non-profitability or lack of profitability of the state uh, public sector units. There's also some emphasis on, uh, so where would you, I mean, to, to move up that 9% thing, you will have to lift the economy to a higher value chain, just like you spoke about Vietnam uh, and Tamil Nadu experience. So what's the plan? Um, I'll say there are three or four steps. The first, I think, is keeping our fisc in balance. That means the FRBM Act said 0% revenue deficit, 3% fiscal deficit. And as I said, for 11 years, we largely followed that, especially the five years of the DMK government. 6 to 11, despite the global financial crisis, despite some pay commission, you know, major changes in, um, in wages and benefits to the pensioners, uh, it was a net surplus revenue government. Five years, there was a revenue surplus. So, what you're trying to say is that the difference between borrowing for revenue expenses, even though they may be good expenses like free food to school children or free laptops, as opposed to building roads or ports or hospitals or drinking water systems, there's a different multiplier effect. Possibly, to some extent, at a gross level, yes. So the idea is to bring the revenue deficit down to zero and put as much of your borrowing into uh, capital expenditure as possible. Uh, 
I'll come back to that in a minute. As far as the PSUs go, it's relatively clear that many of them have been mismanaged badly. The Tamil Nadu Electricity, uh, the previous TNEB, the now Tanjetco, Tan Transco, Tan Disco, and all that collectively went from 40, 45,000 crores of debt to 1,45,000 crores of debt in the seven years that Ms. Jalta was not there. The Tamil Nadu Civil Supplies Corporation that never carried more than three or 5,000 crores in debt is now carrying some 15 or 17,000. So there has been a lot of mismatch. So we have done two, three things already. One is that we re-examined uh, the existing model and we reissued an updated model from the finance department that says because the government of Tamil Nadu is 100% shareholder in many of these PSUs, in addition to your board, these are the limits beyond which if you want to take any major decisions, you have to actually come back to the government of Tamil Nadu through the finance department's division called BPE, Bureau of Public Enterprises. And without our explicit approval, you cannot do these things anymore. So that put a complete check and that's a revolutionary step, at least as far as the last 10 years is concerned. 10 days ago, we revealed that we have improved the infrastructure for reporting. Otherwise, some PSUs were giving their statements, annual statements, two years, three years, four years later. So all your PSUs report, uh, that's why the national no, no, that, record is pathetic. That's why we put in a website now hmm. where we are requiring the boards of these companies to report at least internally to us for local audit, internal audit, in a timely manner because they can't use the external auditor as a base. So I would say we have taken a lot of steps to bring the PSUs under some you, kind of control. Whether you know, in yeah. the CAG reports of the last year shows that public sector undertakings, state-owned public sector undertakings in West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, in Madhya Pradesh, in many of the states have not submitted records, accounts yeah, yeah. for like a decade, for five yeah, years. When, when, years. I, when I was in the opposition, I was a member of the Public Accounts Committee for five years. So I've read many, many, many hundreds of paras mm -hmm. and many audit reports. The Tamil Nadu version about two years ago was that there were 300 plus uh, corporations, boards, regulatory authorities, entities that had not filed for at least two years, right? 300 plus. So it's, it's, it's endemic, but we're going to fix all it. Now let me come back to the revenue and capital business. As it turns out, we are improving the revenue deficit so rapidly, right? We, we just got the updated GSDP numbers. So in 2021, the last year before we took office, the revenue, the, the fiscal deficit was 5.21%, of which three and a half or three and three quarters of it was simply the revenue deficit. I will give them some benefit for the first year of COVID. The previous year was not that much better. It was, let's say, 4.5 or 4.6. Last year, we brought it down to 338 on the old estimate or 357 in the new estimate. But the big difference was that the entire savings was in revenue deficit. So we took the revenue deficit down out of this 3.5 or so to only about 1.8 or something like that. This year, we're going to publish the numbers. We've given some interim report to the assembly already. So based on that report, I would project. I can't say the actual numbers because I'm bound by confidentiality. But we will now be trending towards maybe one, one and a quarter percent only uh, revenue deficit and the rest fiscal. Because let's be very clear, in a growing economy, it is the job of the government to borrow up to 3%. Not only is it a ceiling, it's a floor. Because government borrowing comes at the lowest cost, is invested in the highest multiplier projects and gets executed with the least risk if you do it right. So in fact, borrowing for capex for you know, investment is a good thing. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what gives us the multiplier effect. Now we have a different problem. Because we once used to borrow only for capex, I told you, right? We had a revenue surplus state. So we only borrowed for capex. We had the execution capability between the government and all the contractors and vendors and everybody together. We could actually execute up to 3% of GDP in projects because the state kept spending less and less and less. We have now come to a point where last year and most likely this year, we are going to miss our capital spending targets, not because we didn't have money, but because we couldn't execute fast enough. Now, last year, we had the floods, uh, almost floods of 2015. This year, we had a bounce back. But again, there are systems don't stand around waiting for you to have the money. If you don't spend the money, the capacity decays. And so what has happened now for us is that if we are on this trajectory, as I've said, latest by 24, 25, or maybe 25, 26, we'll be a revenue neutral state. At that time, 
our GSDP will be 30 lakh crores. At least, at that time, we'll have to invest at least 90,000 or 1 lakh crores. Where are we going to find the execution capability? So now my bottleneck is not money anymore. It's execution capability. And for that, I think we have to look at PPP models. We have to look at people who are willing to put their own capital and skin the game. Not because we need their capital, but because we need their talent, their discipline, their professionalism, their execution skill. Then we'll get the outcome. Yeah. And, and, and the number the, of, of people course, for of course, that. The, no, and the engineering expertise, the experience of having done these projects elsewhere in the world, that, that kind of people. It's not just the human beings. I mean, it's not just the sheer number of people, but yes. it's the experts. That we need. So, just for a layman's understand, understanding, will Tamil Nadu be able to grow at a fast enough pace to afford this level of spending, or will it be stretching its legs outside the blanket? Again, I tell you, right, the world, I'm a former investment banker, the world is awash with money. If you provide the right framework, the right environment, the right confidence level to investors, whether they are financial investors who are buying bonds and equity and mutual funds and, and uh, capital uh, shares in, uh, in alternate investment manager or venture capital, or whether the, the global corporates that are coming and setting up car factories or chip factories or iPhone manufacturing facilities. If you provide them the right environment, the right talent pool, reasonable ease of doing business and reasonable kind of quality of life for the expats and the people. You can get unlimited amounts of investment. There is no shortage at all in the world. It, we are not capital constrained. The one who agrees with me the most on this is through Nitin Gadkari. We were both at a ceremony in Delhi. You know you are a dangerous company. <laughs> <laughs> is that we can raise unlimited amounts of money. India is such a shining story in the global environment. You provide the right environment, there is unlimited amount of money. It is the execution skill. It is the framework. It is the environment. These are the things that good governance and good governments can provide. The money will come. We only, I'm, I'm saying I, didn't, I wasn't able to spend the money last year that I budgeted to spend. I don't need other people's money. If I want, there's a lot of money. So, right. yeah, the absorptive capacity and the execution are all this. Now, we have three minutes. You're here. You're from Madurai, the finance minister from Madurai in the center. We can't let you go without your comments on what you thought of the budget and whether we will really grow between 6 to 6.8 or 6.4. How, how do you, I mean, there is a perception that you completely diametrically differ from the, the way the government in Delhi thinks about development, growth, economic uh, progress. And you, so one way to express this, how you diametrically differ from the government or don't differ is to sort of give us an analysis, a quick three minute analysis of the union budget. Look, I, I have been loath to go on TV, um, both for personal relationships with a lot of the senior officials, the finance minister, the finance secretary, all good uh, personal friends of mine. Uh, and, you know, it's a difficult job. I would say, as long as somebody says what they do and does what they say, then the people get to decide. I have a completely different model. I want to focus on human development, quality of life, equality, keeping the stratification of society low and I know that that will attract the right level of investment and talent and give me the right outcome. That's my view of the world. It's been validated to some extent over 100 years of the development of time now. The Gujarat view of the world, which is now the Indian government's view of the world, you must have seen the Economist article, the Gujaratification of India after the Gujarat poll, is that you actually get national champions or state champions, you give them a lot of money, they build a lot of factories and then you'll get trickled down to the people and all that stuff and therefore you'll see political, I mean you'll see poverty alleviation and you'll see better outcomes in education. And in fact that is not proven to be true. Gujarat and Tamil Nadu have roughly the same per capita income as the economists pointed out, but their poverty rate is four times higher than ours and only 50% of the girls in uh, at 18 have gone through high school. Right? So we have completely different society. It's okay. As long as I say these are my values, I act according to these values and I get the right outcome, the people can decide if that's what they want or not. What worries me a lot about the union government is that they say they're for the poor. They say that they're putting more schemes. They say that they're sending money into the you know, benefits of the poor. But in fact, the, the, the numbers don't reflect that. 
and whatever execution problem I have, they have a much bigger execution problem because they have a much bigger execution ambition. So broadly, I would say the twist away from progressive taxation and progressive spending, more to the poor, more from the rich, is antithetical to my approach of how I would frame my budget. And when my budget comes out, at least there'll be a comparison to say, what is the difference in kind of the priorities of this, right? But at the end of the day, what does it matter, my philosophy, your philosophy, a budget is a statement of intent. Only when the final account comes out a year and a half later, you'll know what was actually achieved. The numbers vary so much between, at least for me, I try to keep it down. But in the union government, the numbers can vary by one lakh or two lakh crores between the budget and the final account. So let's wait for the outcome. The outcome will tell us, you know, which approach was right or wrong and what did it achieve. And did it achieve what you said you wanted to achieve? These are all the benchmarks that we should all be held accountable to. And then we'll know, you know, who's doing what job. No, your arguments are always reasonable. You have a sound rationale to all your arguments. Today I found there's a bit of diplomaties laced in their comments. So that is a new <laughs> addition to... Uh, well, maybe I'm finally growing up. I, I <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's push you a little more. Push you, a little time, yeah. push you a little more. What's the one thing that they did you wouldn't do and what's the one thing that they didn't do that you would have done? I would have tried to make the taxation regime more progressive. Right now, too much of the tax revenue comes from the poor and middle class and too little of it comes from the rich. And I don't have that power as a state minister because we don't have any of the progressive taxation tools constitutionally. They're only over there. Agriculture? No, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I can have a tax independent of the union, yeah. but uh, let's, yeah. Um, the thing that they do a lot that I wouldn't do is that this centrally sponsored scheme stuff. And, you know, at first it only used to be people like me who you consider kind of, uh, what did you say? Uh, the dissent. dissent. <laughs> now the dissent seems to have spread because when I was in the uh, finance minister's meeting with the Honorable Union Finance Minister in Delhi in November, state after state with the BJP, pure BJP or BJP coalition government asked the questions that I always used to ask. I said, why do you take so much in cesses and surcharges? Why don't you put it into the divisible pool and give it to us? Why do you call it centrally sponsored scheme and then intrude into state subjects that you're not supposed to be? Why do you call it PM, ABC, but you put only 20% of the money and we put 80% of the money and you still call it PM, ABC? These questions which only people like I, uh, you know, DMK and South used to ask, Northern and BJP and Western states are asking these questions now. So I think this is a healthy sign in a democracy because we can't all be rebellious and dissenters by nature, right? I mean... Uh, the virus is spreading. Yeah, I don't know about that. Or logic, <laughs> logic or, or uh, patriotism for the citizens of our state relative to being uh, respectful to the leader. That way, yeah. I'm Pramin from MJ University. Will state government face some burden if central government brings GST on petrol and diesel? I have answered this multiple times, I will be as brief as possible. The logic of bringing something into GST is to state that it has a standard rate and currently all governments at all states and the union tax petrol and diesel significantly higher than the highest rate of GST. So on one level I can see that it brings equality and all this stuff. But there are two nuances to this. The first is the union gets to decide how much of its taxes it will take from what source, progressive taxes like income taxes, corporate taxes and how much from regressive. We don't have any progressive taxes, we only have to take from uh, point of sale taxes and regressive taxes. But the more important nuance is that most of what the union takes today from the petrol and diesel, it takes a cess. So were we to go from a tax regime to a GST regime, the union could continue to levy, levy cess independent of the GST and still take 20 or 30 rupees per litre cess. And we would, I mean, we, we would lose not an insignificant amount of money, but not enough money to change my life. We'd probably lose two or three or four thousand crores were we to go GST instead of that. The more philosophical reason why we oppose the union trying to homogenize the few taxes that are left with the states is that at that point we become like municipalities. If we don't get to determine any rate for anything 
and the so-called GST council which is so-called federal but the agenda is set by the union government they have a 33 percent vote the minimum required to pass is 75 so they have effective vote uh, veto on everything and for you to defeat a union gov government measure because they've given one state one vote you'll have to rally 12 states there are not actually 12 rich net donor states in this country so everybody's for higher taxation because they'll get more money except the rich donor states like Karnataka, Gujarat, uh, Tamil Nadu, Maharashtra. So the system is rigged. And if I give up the last few levers of control that I have, then I become just an execution agency as it is. On the way out, they decide because they call it centrally sponsored scheme, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, finish at Z, go to 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 after that. Then on the way in also, they'll decide what can be collected by whom. Then what is the value of having governance here at a logical level, at an execution level, it is impossible to conceive of a homogeneous fiscal policy for a country that has such diverse states as our Indian states are. I've just told you the contrast between Gujarat and Tamil Nadu, which are already very rich states. Were I to tell you the difference between Tamil Nadu and Bihar, where the per capita income in Tamil Nadu is 4x, the gross enrollment ratio in tertiary education is 4 or 5x, then why should one homogeneous policy make sense for all these people? Nowhere else in the world do we have this kind of you know, uh, administrative uh, hallucination that you can run one policy for 1.4 billion people from Delhi and make it successful. It, it, does, it hasn't worked anywhere in the history of the world. It's not likely to start now. That's a new one. Administrative hallucination. I should use that on Twitter. Uh, uh, one last question well, again from a student. Sir, warm good afternoon, sir. It was really a thought-provoking thought session, sir. Uh, when you are mentioning about the human development as an objective of social justice, uh, knowing the ill effects of the alcoholism and the drug addiction, is there any possibility in the near future where we can overcome the dependency on alcohol for the revenue? As you just now mentioned that we are one of the richest states in India. And uh, is there any possibility in the near future, sir? And I am not asking for any specific date to be mentioned. Sir. Yeah, again, as with anything, you ask me a question, you'll get a very nuanced answer, right? Uh, I'll separate this into two or three parts. If the point is that the government of Tamil Nadu cannot run without alcohol taxes, that's not true. Uh, we can run many ways. The, it's 20 or 30,000 crores. It's not an insignificant number, but it's not a, you know, kill the finances of the state number. If the point is, is it possible to achieve total prohibition uh, in real terms, not in politicians speak just for words and then you know you know what can be bought in Gujarat at what time for what price. So if it's, is it possible to be a globally connected multi-state uh, neighbor, porous borders, uh, state in which you can enforce prohibition? My own personal experience in life at 57 years or 56 years is that it cannot be done. It's not enforceable. I'm not saying whether it should be the right policy or not. If you go to the next level and you say, in this current somewhat restricted regime, are we really curtailing alcoholism or the ill effects of alcohol? My personal view, not. And that's independent of politics. That was not true in the previous regime. It's not true in this regime. We are probably not able to quantify the ill effects of alcohol through absenteeism, domestic abuse, health impact, you know, all kinds of other costs of alcoholism, violence, crime. We don't know how to quantify that. We are getting some money because we see it as tax and that also has been slipping and slipping and a lot of fraud is happening there. That's a different story. I mean, I'm saying 10 year trajectory. I'm not talking today. So uh, if you ask me, is this model somehow preventing the ills from entering society? The answer is absolutely not. The ills are in society. They have been for a long time. If you ask me, is there any society in the world where they don't tax undesirable activities with sin taxes? The answer is absolutely not. I mean, for that matter, we know that tobacco is extremely harmful. Probably tobacco is much more harmful to people than alcohol. You have to drink lots and lots of alcohol for a long time for you to get any bad effects. Tobacco is much earlier and you get cancer and stuff. That's not curable. Why don't we ban tobacco altogether? So my point is, if you don't have an enforceable ban of practical conditions, then every society in the world taxes them very, very high because you get benefit like, you know, win or lose, you get benefit. Either you tax them so high that curbs consumption or you tax them so high that whoever consumes pays some greater, co uh, you know, a share into the state for the ill effects that their consumption is going to provide 
as a cost to the state later in absenteeism, in health, in uh, domestic abuse, whatever. So these are not uh, black and white, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, this concept cliche that this government runs on alcohol, complete nonsense, right? There are governments that don't have alcohol revenue that are run worse than us. There are governments that have alcohol revenues that are run better than us. So, you know, politics is politics. Intelligent people should be nuanced and thoughtful and look at the issues with like some clarity. Uh, sound bites are just nonsense anyway. Right? Thank you very much. Thank you, Finance yeah, Minister. Thank you. Thank it was lovely you. listening to you. As always, I, I, recent, I recently heard an economist answer a question saying that I am an economist. I can't give you one answer. I will give you two or three or four answers. Uh, Mr. PTR has a new way of saying it. I will give you layered answers and nuances. So thank you for all the layers and all the nuances and that lovely phrase, administrative hallucination. I am heading for Twitter just now. Thank you very much. Thank you.